Revolution by Zoe Davies and Alia Drake. Chapter 1 Leone Cold and Hunger Out of the two, Leone couldn't decide which was worse. Was it feeling the vicious stabs of damp cold knifing their way down to her bones, so that every joint ached and her very blood felt like it was freezing into shards of ice that had travelled around her body and pierced every vein? Or the crushing emptiness, which was the only thing filling her body and radiating from the very pit of her insides, from not having eaten for several days? Mama said that it was because the harvest had been bad again this year. But Leone wasn't sure if she could ever even remember a year when the harvest had been good. Certainly, the financial crisis three years ago had hit hard, and things had been getting steadily worse. They depended on the harvest, not only for food, but to provide some work in order to earn the little money they could, to pay for fuel and other necessities. And of course the taxman still needed paying. That would never change. Leone pulled the threadbare blanket even tighter around herself and huddled closer to her younger sisters and brothers. If they were lucky, Mama might return with a cabbage that was past its best and so not down in price. Or some stale bread that the bakery couldn't sell for full price. The water they could get from the well to make soup with, but it needed something to fill it out, otherwise it was just boiled water. They'd finished the last rotten potato two days previous, and poor little Francis had only brought it back up again. He desperately needed to eat, although his fever was still raging, and Leone was worried that it was already too late. They'd lost little Marie-Louise earlier in the year, and she wasn't sure her heart could take saying goodbye to another sibling so soon, especially when their deaths were so easily preventable, if they could only get hold of some decent nutrition. Mama finally returned after the sun had set. She looked tired and drawn, although Leonie wasn't sure if it was due more to exhaustion or stress. With six mouths to feed and little work to be found due to the bad harvest, the pressure was immense. It may have been easier if Papa was still here, but he hadn't been seen since he left to help fight the British in the Bourbon War when France had allied with the Americans several years ago. The war had practically bankrupted the country, so her uncle Jean-Luc said, and directly contributed to the poverty that they were now suffering. Her father had never even seen his last son born, and Marie-Louise was still a baby when he left. Having a man in the house may have meant more income and less toil for her poor mamma, although, on second thoughts, he would have been another mouth to feed, so maybe not much help after all. "'Let me help you, Mama. Leone shook her musings away and rushed over to her mother to help carry the basket into the room. She looked down and struggled to hide her disappointment at the tiny cabbage lying at the bottom. Its leaves were half eaten by pests and the rest browned and curling. She just hoped it'd be enough to trick their bellies into thinking they were full. Maybe if she added too much salt. Then the little ones would be thirstier and drink lots of water so they'd fill their bellies quicker and with less. Her mamma collapsed onto the wooden bench and bent over, her cough racking her body as she pulled her scarf around her. The younger ones huddled together, searching for comfort and a degree of warmth to fight off the early spring chill. Mamma gently stroked Lillianne's head and pulled Francis close to her. She sighed heavily after feeling the fierce heat emanating from his small body, and closing her eyes, she shook her head in deep, sorrowful thought. Leone couldn't bear to watch the sad tableau, which was her life any longer, and busied herself trying to make cabbage soup enough to feed them all. 
she had found that shredding the leaves very small made it look like there was more to fill out each person's portion. She tried to ignore her thoughts that were already questioning what they were going to do for food tomorrow and tried to remain in the moment, focusing on what they had tonight. Now that Mama was home, she would start the fire out of the sticks the children had collected earlier in the forest. Most of the wood was still green inside and not dried out nearly enough, so it smoked more than Leonie would have liked, but she sat the cooking pot above it and waited for the water to boil. She wondered what it was like to have never known hunger. Would you appreciate every mouthful that you had? Would you realise how lucky you were? Would you think of those less fortunate? Or would you take it all for granted and assume that everyone lived the same? Chapter 2 Marie-Therese Marie-Therese rested her chin on her fist, stared out the window and sighed. <sighs> the weather was depressing. It was still pouring with rain, as it had all spring, which meant Marie-Therese was once again sequestered inside. Yes, of course, there were worse places to be confined than the palace of Versailles but Marie-Therese wasn't feeling very appreciative right now. She was bored and longed to stroll outside amongst the fountains, playing hide-and-seek with her ladies. She had once suggested that they went anyway, despite the weather, but it was met with such horror, almost as if she had suggested they strip down to their undergarments and dance in the rain. But she never suggested it again. What was she supposed to do, except sit quietly in pretty outfits, read the same suitable books, and eat the delicate but rich cakes her mother was so fond of? She was growing very plump, more than was befitting of a princess, and she was bored, oh, so very, very bored. She was sure she'd read every story in the library at least twice and couldn't stand the thought of threading another needle for the pointless embroidery. She dreamed of being able to go out riding once more, joining her father on a hunt and showing off her own archery skills. She turned to listen to her ladies moaning once again about the emerging middle class or the bourgeoisie the newly established social class who had made a lot of money through business dealings and felt that gave them the right to live the same lavish lifestyles as the nobility they catered to. It's not right! They parade their money around in front of us, showing off how much they are profiting from us with trade we can have no part of. It's against the laws of nature, that's what it is. I don't understand why the king has allowed it to go on for so long. They're only third estate. Third estate! But Madame Fromage has double the number of dresses I have. They're putting us all to shame. But what happens to us if they gain more and more offices at court? Before long we will be overrun with riffraff. And then what happens? What will become of us when they realise that they hold both money and power? Ladies, ladies, come now. You're scaring the princess. The king in his anointed wisdom has increased the prices of the offices once again. They're either become unaffordable to these people, or we will profit from their sales. Marie-Therese felt annoyed at others speaking for her. She'd listened to enough of her father's discussions on the ideas of enlightenment to not feel as threatened by the bourgeoisie as others. Really, what extra power could they believe themselves to have just because of a new rung in the social hierarchy? Especially one that had been created just to appease their egos. One that the king could so easily take away as he bestowed it. Were the royal family not chosen by God himself to rule? Didn't nobility hold their status and enjoy their privileges because of the blood that ran through their veins? No amount of money could change the nature of who they were and where they really stood within the natural order. Marie-Therese wondered where her brother, the Dufon, could be. 
It was rare their paths crossed, now that he had to have lessons in how to be a king and got to take part in sword fighting and military tactics. She wished she could join him. She had good hand-eye coordination and was quite certain she could beat him if only she was allowed to train. But it was not befitting of a princess of France and so she had to entertain herself with more acceptable and feminine pursuits such as those that her mother favoured. She tugged at her elaborate pink dress, which felt heavy and made her feel sticky in the humidity. She was told she should be appreciative of having the finest clothes made from the most exquisite and up-to-date Parisian fashions. She was told over and over that she was the envy of the world, that thousands of girls looked at her portraits and wished that they too could sample her fancy clothes and shoes. She was told there were poor children in this very country who had rags which had more holes and fabric to cover themselves with. Marie-Therese was convinced, though, that they, in fact, were the lucky ones. Her clothes were nothing if not bothersome, itchy, scratchy and just made her feel hot and uncomfortable. They made it impossible to climb trees or go for long walks or do anything but sit and look decorative. She felt as though she was her mother's prized doll, her sole purpose to be dressed up and displayed for all to envy. Sometimes petted or played with, but mostly just abandoned in a corner to gather dust. Who could really envy her existence? Chapter 3 Leone It's happened! They've actually done it! Leone's uncle, Jean-Luc, burst into the house and did a little jig. You're getting wet mud on the floor! shrieked Leone's mamma, batting at Jean-Luc with her cleaning rag, trying to get him to stay still before he caused any more damage. Who's done what, uncle? asked Leone, trying to hide her amusement, unsure whether to laugh at her uncle and risk angering mamma further. The third estate deputies have defied the king! This he spat on the floor in disgust at the mere mention of King Louis the Sixteenth, and have declared themselves a national assembly. Mamma gasped and clutched her hands to her mouth, her face a mask of fear. Leone looked back and forth between her mamma and uncle, not really comprehending what her uncle had said or why it caused mamma so much shock. I don't understand. What does that mean and how does it affect us so much that you're dancing in our kitchen? Leone was very confused. Oh, Leone, her uncle looked at her with twinkling eyes. You're more than old enough to know the politics of your country and your circumstances. The king, he said with contempt and spat again on the clean floor. His sister flinched. The king, he repeated, keeps this country divided. He stays above it all and lets the first and second estates feed off us workers of the third estate like scavengers picking at a carcass. They're exempt from his taxes even though they have the money. He only taxes those who have nothing, not those who do nothing. The first estate are the clergy, the so-called men of God and his church who add to our hardships by issuing additional taxes. Of course they don't call it that. They say it's a tithe payable to God but still their bellies grow fat as ours disappear. The second estate of the nobility. These favoured by the king and given titles and land, they can pass down to their children. Most are pigs with their noses in the troughs, but a few are sympathetic to us. So we are the third estate, asked Leone tentatively. Yes, ma chérie, we are the third estate. We are the workers, the backbone of this land, the mecha the mechanism that keeps it running. We have given our power away for too long and now we are taking it back. His face glowed with triumph and zeal. Celeste buried her face in her hands, crying out in fear. Jean-Luc, hush! Do not say these things so openly! Uncle Jean-Luc burst out laughing at the sound of Mama's muffled voice and pulled her hands away from her face, gripping them tightly in his excitement. 
this is a good thing, Celeste. It means we finally have representation for our needs, our wants. The ruling classes refuse to grant us equal votes, so we will take them. The National Assembly will create a whole new constitution. Mama wrenched her right hand away and quickly made the sign of a cross from her forehead to her chest and then left to right across both shoulders. It's not natural, Jean-Luc. They, they are going against the will of God, she whispered, starting to shake and look over at her children as if to make sure no dark cloud was forming around them. Not natural. Not natural. How can it be natural for a few elites to be in charge of so many? Those who have never earned the positions they hold, but merely lucky enough to be born into them. How can it be natural for your children to starve and freeze, whilst the second estates gorge themselves on luxuries, run around in silks, and get the first estates to tell us that we're evil for questioning it? Think, Celeste, think. Why do they deserve to be any more privileged than us? If they were to bleed, would blue really flow from their veins? Or would it pour red like ours? Mama shook her head vigorously. No, Jean-Luc, do not say such things. Their right is God-given. It is not for the understanding of us peasants. Jean-Luc gave an elaborate shrug of his shoulders, knowing he could not convince his sister of his beliefs, and rather than seeing what she said as true, was sure the evidence of the coming days, weeks and months ahead would produce evidence and proof that what he was saying was achievable. He pulled a package from his pocket and placed it gently on the table. I brought some willow bark for Francis. Hopefully this will break his fever. How did you ever afford it, Jean-Luc? Mama questioned, her eyes slightly narrowing. Uncle Jean-Luc briefly looked at the children, then back at Mama. It's better not to ask. Use it, Celeste, and pray it makes Francis better. With that, he turned around and moved swiftly out the door, not caring that it slammed behind him. Chapter 4 Leone. Mama sighed and turned to Leone. Fetch some wood from outside, the driest you can find. Henri, go and collect some water from the well. Mama set to making the fire as warm as she could. This would not only help Francis sweat and hopefully release the poisons building up in his body, but also boil the water with the willow bark inside. Once the mixture was cooled, she tried spooning it into Francis's mouth but he had only moaned pitifully and barely opened his cracked lips to allow the fluid to trickle in. His eyes, dark like papa's, remained firmly shut. That night, Leone and her brothers and sisters took turns running to the creek, the best place for the coolest water, for their leaky tin bucket. Returning to Mama, they watched as she dipped strips of fabric and placed them gently all over Francis's frail body. He was growing hotter and hotter, so that within minutes of placing a new strip, the fabric quickly turned warm, all the cold replaced by heat. The younger ones grew tired, tripping over their own feet in the dark, and Leone was worried they may fall into the creek and be lost. So she sent them to bed, insisting that she could carry enough by herself. Leone was exhausted. She'd lost count of the number of trips back and forth she'd made. The sky was beginning to lighten, the blacks and greys turning into shades of blues and purples. The birds started stretching their wings and trilling in order to prepare for welcoming the new day. As she pushed open the door, she stopped. The air within the house had changed. Her mamma slumped forward with her head in her hands and on hearing the door turned her tear-streaked face towards Leone and gently shook her head, her eyes as misty as the foggy dawn. Leone let the bucket fall to the floor, the water seeping into the wood like tears into a handkerchief. She ran to the cot where Francis lay and saw that his red flushed cheeks were already turning grey. She threw herself over his body and sobbed. Her poor
poor baby brother. Francis was gone. She felt her mamma pull her back and draw her in towards her, heart to broken heart. She clung to her mother and felt both their bodies shake with mingled cries of despair and pain that burst out from the very depths of her, consuming her whole being and burying her in the emotions she hadn't felt since her papa had left their cheeks pressed together. She didn't know where her tears ended and her mother's began. So entwined was their outpouring of grief. On hearing the cries, the others awoke and ran into the room, clutching onto the ma and sister, joining in the wails of loss that would alert the village that yet another child had surrendered to the poverty, another body buried in the earth, with nothing to show that they ever breathed, laughed and dreamed, except a wooden cross made from sticks, found in the forest. Chapter 5 Marie Therese Marie Therese watched as the palace servants raced around, setting up the ballroom and making the preparations for another one of her mother's grand parties. Her father was never as excited for the social events and would rather be in his private quarters, playing with his locks and keys. Marie Therese wished he would show her how to make one, but he simply shook his head if she asked, tell her to leave and would close the door behind her. Marie Therese was looking forward to the party. It would be a break in her current daily monotony from being trapped inside. She watched as dozens of different cakes and patisseries were each carefully placed for the most aesthetic view and perfect presentation. Her mouth watered in anticipation and she quickly snatched one when no one was looking. A miniature square cake with white icing purple ribbon tied around the base and ice violet flowers decorating the top. She quickly popped it in her mouth, letting the sweetness flow around her taste buds and savoured the flavours of vanilla, rose and sugar. She meandered through the staff and decorations, wondering if the cooks had been lazy and made all the cake flavours the same. Her mother, the great Marie Antoinette, had always loved parties. She was renowned for throwing the best and most elaborate celebrations, each surpassing the last. No expenses were ever spared, much to the disapproval of Marie Therese's father. Whenever Louis questioned Marie Antoinette on her spending, her blue eyes would sparkle and her lips form that teasing smile that only he could raise. She'd laugh her girly trill and cry, But Louis, we are the rulers of the very greatest kingdom. It would be a dishonour to God not to show off and enjoy all the blessings he has bestowed upon us. To which she'd have no reply. Marie Therese couldn't help feeling sorry for her father. He was a quiet man who felt content only when his daily routines ran exactly as they should, and he was left to indulge in his passions, mainly hunting and locksmithing. When snooping in his room, she once found his private diaries, and hoped that she might finally discover how he really felt about her. He was always so distant, both in public and in private. Inside, however, it contained nothing of his innermost thoughts and feelings, as Marie Therese had hoped, but instead was endless lists of animals he brought down in hunting and the names and characters of the horses he rode. She had flung it down in frustration and wondered if the whispers were correct, that there was little intelligence or substance within her father's headspace. Her mother's overindulgence had only increased since the death of Marie Therese's younger brother, Louis Joseph, who had been the original Dauphin. It had only been a few short weeks since his death, and many questioned the Queen's morality in throwing yet another party. While the country's longed-for Dauphin lay dead, his successor being rumoured to not even be of royal descent. 
Marie Therese was convinced that there was no substance to this, because although her mother could flirt and court favours with the best of them, she was devoted to her husband, and her children were born from her love of him. She knew better than anyone how her mother loved them all deeply, especially her lost Louis Joseph. She felt the parties were her mother's way of trying to distract herself from his loss, trying to mask the agony of his death with food and wine so that she could forget, even for a few small minutes, the ache in her fractured heart. Marie Therese also knew that Marie Antoinette would spend the rest of the night after she retired crying into her pillow so that her makeup stained the covers beyond repair. She'd heard the servants gossiping about the waste of yet more sheets only this morning. She pinched another cake, pleased to find it was chocolate and not as perfumed as the first. Then she retreated to her room to begin preparations for being presentable at the party. First she was bathed in warm waters which had been infused with the sweetest smelling oils. On being dried she then began the long process of being dressed. It took several of her lady's maids to help her into her different layers of the brand new green silk her mother had procured. As much as she struggled with the weight of the gowns bestowed upon her, she couldn't help but be pleased by her reflection. This one had the glow of the finest green emeralds. It had gems and pearls sewn into patterns across the bodice that sparkled as she moved. Her new silk slippers were a matching green and heeled, and her stockings were embroidered with flowers, similar to those decorating the tiny cakes. Now that she was eleven, she was permitted to have her face powdered and makeup applied. She watched her transformation in the mirror, unsure if she'd recognise her own reflection when she was finished. Lastly, a brand new wig was applied. It was heavier than any of the others that her mother had made her wear previously. And when she looked in the mirror, she could see that, as well as strings of pearls, there were also flowers and stuffed birds fixed to it. It was so heavy, Marie Therese was unsure how she could possibly dance. And it was sure to give her a headache in the hours she was allowed to join her parents for at the feast, before being returned to her rooms. The evening was spent in a whirl of colours, noises and smells. People dancing, eating and laughing, gossiping in little groups around the room. Marie Therese liked to swirl around, snatching a cake here and there, whilst listening to their talk. Mostly it was about who was wearing what and who was in love with whom. But every so often... She heard snatches of conversations that seemed more serious and more alarming, about the discontent among the commoners of the third estate, of how yet another bad harvest had caused famine to sweep across the country, that the people of the third estate were dying and that those left behind were getting angrier by the day. Marie Therese tried to ask her mother about the things she had heard, but the Queen had shooed her away laughing, insisting it was a party and there was no call for serious faces. She worried if the food might run out for them as well, but looking around the ballroom, it was hard to imagine anyone was starving in their glorious country. She tried to remember her lessons in politics, how her father had a divine mandate from God that allowed him to rule. Then there was the clergy of the first estate, who enforced the will of God and kept meticulous records of births and deaths and marriages, holding the information on lineages, entitlements and estates. They were not paid, but were instead granted authority to levy a 10% tax called a tithe, so that they could keep doing their good and necessary works. Next came the second estate, the nobility and aristocracy, like herself and her family. Only they could hold positions of authority in government and in the church. They didn't have to pay taxes, because they did all the important jobs for the king and kept the common people honest. If they were not present to enforce the laws, who knew what trouble and crime the people of the third estate would perpetrate? There'd be chaos and anarchy. The country would fall apart. 
the bourgeoisie had become a class of its own. They did not inherit their money or titles though, so they didn't have the natural etiquette that was bred into the aristocracy. But they tried hard to rise above the stigma of their final class, the third estate. This was mostly made up of peasants and farmers. They grew the food and did the smelly, boring jobs that didn't need any high intelligence to perform. They were always whining about being poor, but she had not seen any evidence that they did anything more than complain about their circumstances. It must be that the third estate were lazy, she concluded. She told herself that they simply couldn't be bothered to work properly, to provide themselves with food and decent clothing. Maybe they were too stupid, or lacked the proper pride in their work. Whereas the nobles clearly were superior. They had everything they ever needed, probably because of their higher intelligence and blessed blue blood. Chapter 6 The Third Estate Did you hear? Hear what? The Queen was partying! Partying? Partying! And not one month since our poor Dufan was laid in the ground. What kind of woman? What kind of queen? What kind of mistress of sin? Dancing with the devil for sure. No wonder we're all starving. And all our money taken for our parties. And all our remaining crops taken to fill their fat bellies. Well, the nobles and clergy pay nothing. They sit there growing fat while we toil and suffer. Whilst our children are dying and we are starving. Starving! Starving! And did you hear what that she-devil said? When? When our assembly leaders told her that we were starving. What? What did she say? We can't afford bread, our leaders begged. It's true! It's true! So what did she say? Let them eat cake! Let them eat cake? Let them eat cake! The evil! She is pure evil! She doesn't deserve it! She doesn't deserve to be queen! Why do any of them deserve it? Why do any of them deserve to lord over us? Us who work every day of the year. Us who break our backs to put cakes on their table when we can't even afford stale bread. What do they ever do except grow fat in their laziness on the backs of our efforts? I say down with them. Down with them? Down with them! We all say down with them! Down with them! Down with them! We all say down with them in their gluttonous ways. No more lords. No more taxes. No more estates. We can rule ourselves. We don't need them. They depend on us. They don't do anything except party and play games. What would they do if we all just stopped? I say down with them, the lot of them. Down with them, down with them. Chapter 7 Leone Celeste, Celeste, it's happening. It's actually happening. What is happening, Jean-Luc? The revolution! The end of tyranny! The people are finally finding their voice and realising their power. Mama gasped and rushed to the window to see if anyone was near and could overhear. What are you saying, Jean-Luc? This is treason! You'd have us all arrested! Jean-Luc laughed a loud, full laugh that seemed to rise from the very depths of his belly. He echoed out from there and the sound bouncing off his Empty stomach walls. Not any more, Celeste. The king has gone a step too far this time. The members of the royal court have been calling for the dismissal of the finance minister for some time, you know. Well, two days ago, the king actually granted their idiotic request and dismissed Monsieur Jacques Necker. Can you believe that is the thanks he's been given for pulling this country out of the financial crisis those elite hedonists have caused with their own excesses? He was one of the few who's for the people on our side. 
where we're taking control before they try and arrest the members of the National Assembly. And soon it will be them that has to answer to us. Are you coming? Coming where? To the Bastille. We're going to take it. Destroy their power and control. Why the Bastille? You said yourself it's already scheduled for demolition. Because it's a symbol of our oppression for over a hundred years. All our despotic kings have used it to keep us in line. He replied, his voice quavering with excitement. So are you going to join us? No, of course not. Oh, Jean-Luc, speak sense. How can we take the Bastille? They have guns. They have cannons. We're just people, ordinary people. Jean-Luc bent down and kissed Mama on the head. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a cloth in red, white and blue which he pinned to his breast. This is really it, Celeste. Everything is going to change. Life is going to be good. Just you wait and see. He reached the door and waved at them before running into the street to join a growing crowd marching along the street towards the Bastille. Mama shook her head, and Leonie realised silent tears were rolling down her mother's cheeks. Mama, Mama, oh, what's wrong? This can only be good, no? Oh, Leonie, what will we do? He's going to get arrested or killed. But Mama, the streets are full of people, look. They turned to the window to see more and more people joining the march. Everyone seemed angry and purposeful. Some people carried tools from their farm work, wielding scythes and pitchforks and brandishing them like weapons in the air. I'm going to watch, Mama. I'll keep an eye on Jean-Luc. No, Leonie, you could be hurt. I won't get close, I promise. I'll keep watch and let you know what happens. Before her Mama could stop her, Leonie darted out of the door and into the streets. She quickly got caught up in the crowd before her mamma could reach the door, calling after her. No, Leonie, come back! Oh, Leonie, you must come back! Each street that they passed, more people joined. Soon the crowd had swelled to hundreds of people. Rumours were passing through that gunpowder had been moved to the Bastille and that the drawbridges had been raised. Others discussed the conditions of the Bastille and the hundreds of people that must be locked up there in the orders of the corrupt monarchy. The Bastille loomed in front of them, where crowds of people had already gathered below its walls, swelling all the time with a number of people pouring in from the surrounding streets. Some were chanting, others were making plans on how to scale the walls. A sense of tension was quickly building, like a powder keg about to explode. The Bastille's governor, Bernard René de Looney, has refused the delegates' demands. What were they? That he surrenders the fortress and the 250 barrels of gunpowder that they've got stored there. He refused to do anything without the authority of the king. How many men does he have inside the walls? Only 80-odd of the invalids. What will he do with them? The invalids are veterans of many battles. They're highly trained. They're old and decrepit. Past their prime. Look how many there are of us. A call went up from the front of the crowd and people turned like a wave to look at the fortress walls. At first, Leonie thought that the guards were about to fire upon the crowd and she quickly looked around to see where she could run to. The crowd was so packed she wasn't sure how she could ever escape. But then she noticed the cannons were being rolled back away from the walls. They're surrendering! Surely now they're open the gates? No, they're moving the cannons to better prepare for battle. Rumours spread. People both energised and nervous at the turn of events what and what they might mean. The crowd began to organise, the men drawing nearer to the front and the onlookers falling back. Leonie had long since lost sight of her uncle, but still she stayed and watched. Something was going to happen, surely, any moment now. And then it did. The outer drawbridge fell down, clattering loudly. The crowd cheered and rushed forward, certain that the governor had seen sense, and opened the gates. Seconds later, gunshots began and the noise tore through the waiting crowd. 
They only threw her hands over her ears and cowered in the shop doorway, trying to make herself as small as possible. Still people ran forward, pushing through the open gates despite the doom that was awaiting them. It felt like an eternity of gunfire, erupting, followed by cries of pain. Smoke rose above the Bastille walls and it seemed to Leone as if the whole world was on fire. It was a trap! A nearby woman cried, shaking, as she pulled her shawl closer around her. She too was hidden in the door alcove with Leone, as were several other onlookers. They lured them in to trap them in the courtyard. No, I saw two men climbing the walls. It was us that lowered the gates. Another woman pointed to a spot on the fortress walls, too far for Leone to really make anything out in detail. The July heat, tainted by the smoke from the battle, increased and Leone desperately needed water, but she was too scared to leave her hiding place. She was certain at any moment the king's guards would come pouring out of the gates onto the streets and would kill them all. Bodies were dragged out, some calling out with such cries of pain that Leone was sure she would hear them in her nightmares for the rest of her life. And the gunfire seemed to change. Instead of random firing, it seemed to become more ordered. Rumours began to spread again that the invalid turned against Governor de Lone and were now fighting for the people. The atmosphere again became more charged. Could they really do it? Could they actually win? Then, in the mid-afternoon, the gunfire suddenly stopped. The silence, after so much thunder, was just as scary. Then the cheers began. They filled the space left by the guns and echoed out, cheers so triumphant and celebratory that those who were hiding and even more people from the surrounding streets rushed closer. They've done it! They've taken the Bastille! The fortress was theirs! The prisoners are released! The power of the monarchy was crumbling. They had overthrown the guards of Paris and now had all their gunpowder. Everyone looked at each other in disbelief. Then a man was dragged out by the rebels between the gates. They dragged him down the streets towards the Hotel de Ville. People followed. Some shouted at him and others picked up dung from the streets and threw it. Two heads... Those of Delaney and the mayor, Jacques de Flesse, were carried out on pikes and rammed into the ground in front of the battlements. It seemed fitting that life had come full circle for Delaney, having been born and then meeting his end within the walls of the Bastille. Then, amidst those horrors, Leone saw a sight that made her heart sing. There was her uncle Jean-Luc, alive and well, marching with the rest. Desperately wanted to follow him to see what happened next, but knew her mamma would be beside herself with fear, and considering the situation, that she should go and tell her the good news. She took one more glance at the disappearing backs of the crowd, and then turned and ran all the way back to her house. Her mamma was pacing in front of the window, and on seeing Leone appear, ran into the street and pulled her close, before both scolding her for running off and kissing her all over her face and head. Leone repeated all that she had seen. On hearing of Jean-Luc's survival, mamma burst into tears and quickly crossed herself. It's going to be all right, mamma. Everything will be better now. Chapter 8 Marie Therese It seemed to Marie Therese as the whole court was trembling with fear. The very walls of the palace seemed to be vibrating with it. After the horrific slaughter of Governor Delaney and his officials for the sake of a mere seven prisoners, it felt as if the very foundations of France had been pulled out from underneath them. Four of them were counterfeiters. Who'd even want them free? Two were madmen. For the love of the Almighty, what possible use could they be in decent society? The last prisoner was the Marquis de Sade, and he was supposed to be a very evil man. Yet they blamed her lovely gentle father, who had only their best interests at heart. 
that the peasants could turn on those more privileged than themselves and that God allowed it to happen shook to the very core everything the nobles believed to be true of the natural order. The one person who appeared to believe that nothing had changed, that everything would be fine, was her father. Marie Therese knew that the court were growing more and more frustrated with him and his indecision to do anything to stop the rebels or punish them. All he did was tell everyone that this was now the period of enlightenment and that he would be the first fully enlightened king. He seemed to fully believe that he could share power with the rebels and that they in turn would still respect him as king. He called Monsieur Necker back to try and appease the assembly as he continued with his flip-flopping about what to do. The government's stand also seemed to be to do nothing. The whole country seemed to be holding a collective breath, waiting to see what the National Assembly had ordained to be the new legislation, which they'd all have to follow. Time passed. Still no one seemed quite sure who was in charge or what they wanted. The third estate remained intent that they wanted change, but no one seemed to know, nor could they agree exactly what that change was or how to make it happen. The aristocracy became restless. Riots and uprisings continued across the country. The peasants refused to pay their taxes and refused to hand over their dues to the privileged. The upper estate's control became even shakier and no one seemed to sure how to enforce the power when the whole country seemed unified in their defiance. How do you punish 96% of the population? More time passed. Maybe it'd be okay. Maybe this would become the new normal. Her mother continued with her parties. Her father continued with his hunting and making keys. Her brother continued in his training and preparations for becoming the next king. Yet, Marie-Therese couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that something was coming, that the worst had not yet happened. And then... She heard the banging of the drums, the stamps of thousands of marching feet thundering up the road, the calls of anger bringing certain death was coming closer and closer. Chapter 9 Leone Leone breathed in the crisp October air, which heralded the start of the new season. The leaves were starting to brown and fall, crackling beneath her feet as she entered the market. Now should be the time of plenty, the abundance of the year's harvest celebrated in every village, but once again bread was hard to find for most people, and for those who could, it was often unaffordable. Leonie's mamma gripped her hand as they went from one stall to another, each seller sadly shaking their heads. Then a drum began to beat. Strong, loud fuds that seemed to march in time with everyone's heartbeat. They turned towards the source of the sound and saw that it was the beautiful and talented Anne Josephie Farouge de Mericourt. She was a member of the National Assembly a known singer and an orator who used her amazing voice to decry her opinions loudly and was sympathetic to the commoners' cause in general and particularly with the vanquishers of the Bastille. Her beats grew in energy, taking in a life of their own. Then the stallholders began to call out, inspired by her strong presence and the blood red of her outfit, which seemed to represent the very blood of their suffering and loss. Why should we take it any longer? It's time they feel the wrath of the women of this country. We are the heart of this nation. Arm yourselves, ladies. Make the church bells toll so that all will know that now is the time. The time for what? The time we take our grievances to the king. The time we force him to feel our pain. The time for revolution. He only remembered that day, so many months ago, when her uncle had helped to take the Bastille. 
than the ordinary folk had made a difference. Maybe today they could do it again. The only stomach seemed to gurgle in response. Then something happened. Something Leone could never have dreamed of. Her quiet, peaceful, obedient mother let out a cry. A cry filled with the months of repressed pain for the loss of her beloved babies, of watching her remaining children wilting away before her eyes because there was never enough food. A cry loud, defiant, a war cry, a battle cry. She threw her basket on the floor and raised her hand, which was still clasping Leone's in the air. For the Hotel de Ville, she cried. Others joined in the cry and they began running. Leone was pulled along by her mother. She'd never seen her mamma like this and she wasn't sure whether to be scared or exhilarated. More women joined in and then men as well. They descended upon the Hotel de Ville. Leone was sure that they were there to demand bread. But instead they cried for weapons. The crowd swelled, larger than the one that had descended upon the Bastille. Before long the doors were open. Women were grabbing guns and swords, anything that could be used as a weapon. Then a new drum began to sound and a new cry. Versailles! 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 Leone recognised the man leading the chant as one of the leaders of the storming of the Bastille three months ago. He was a member of the National Guard who had been the first to enter the fortress that day. And here he was again, ready to lead the people to victory once more. Leone gripped her mamma's hand even tighter. Her mother was armed with a sword and raised it high in the air as she joined in the chant. As they began marching on the road to Versailles, the rain began to fall. But no one seemed to notice and no one seemed to care. It was as if the very heavens were weeping for every death, every moment of suffering these women had felt. More and more people joined their cause. Then the rest of the National Guards joined. They'd become one voice, finally one unified nation, coming together in their desire for change. As they walked, they debated what they wanted to happen. Some wanted to speak with the king. Others wanted the king to return to Paris, with them where he could be under their control. Some, though, and this frightened Leone the most, were calling for the death of the wicked queen. It took six hours of marching for them to finally see the roofs of the Palace of Versailles. Leone's feet were so sore from walking, she wasn't sure she could actually be able to take another step. Only the desire to see what was going to happen next, to be part of this important moment of history, kept her placing one foot in front of the other. They were met by the assembly and it was only as they reached their halls that the women allowed themselves to collapse and rest. Debates were held over what to do next. Six women were chosen to act as delegates to petition the deputies of the National Assembly. They would go and meet with the king and tell him their demands. Leonie hoped her mother would be picked but Celeste shook her head so they waited and waited and waited. Then the women returned. They exclaimed gleefully that the king had assured them that he would open his very own royal stores to share with them the food he owned. They felt that they had made him listen and things would finally change. As the rain began once again to fall, hammering against the ceiling of the hall, the group seemed to split into two. Those who felt their needs had been listened to and met and those who felt the king had misled and subdued the women and would definitely renegade on their deal. The first, easily satisfied group left and began their long walk home. Leone was sure that they would join them, but her mother shook her head decidedly. We didn't walk all this way for a few scraps of bread from the king's table, she said, with a proud toss of her head. Leone settled back down to wait. Others began to parade around the gardens of the palace. Guards withdrew further back to one end of the park, but 
as they talked with the protesters, more and more began to agree with their cause and came to stand by their side. Leone must have fallen asleep as she felt herself gently shaken awake by her mother. Something's happening! Quick, wake up, my sweet girl! Leone yawned and sat up. The sun was starting to rise, announcing the arrival of morning. Lots of the crowd were sleeping, but many were stirring, aware of a commotion occurring by the palace. Running over, another woman shouted out, We've found an unguarded gate! We can enter the palace and bring that witch to account! They rushed through the gate and into the palace, searching each room for a sign that they had reached the Queen's chambers. The further into the palace they ventured, the more obstacles they faced. The guards tried to delay their onslaught by locking the doors and trying to bar them with furniture. However, the group's numbers were just too large a force to keep contained. The crowd demanded blood, and the blood they craved was blue. Chapter 10. Marie-Therese they're in the palace ma'am we must make haste they're in the palace and looking for you marie therese terrified at the screaming mob surrounding their walls last night had begged her mother to allow her to stay in the queen's rooms her brother had joined them and the two children had clutched at their mother her fear mirrored in both their eyes until the early hours of the morning when they finally passed out from exhaustion but now even that brief respite was broken could hear voices further away echoing within the palace halls accompanied by bangs and crashes it sounded as if the doors were being broken off their very hinges up my petites up our guards will protect us but we must the crashing and banging sounds were coming closer followed by shots and then a roar of anger marie therese watched the colour drain from her mother's face as she grabbed both the children's hands and pulled them towards her father's rooms her ladies' maids followed, some crying, others running, with their heads turning often to glance behind them, the ever-growing sounds of anger coming their way. As they reached the king's rooms, they found them locked. Papa, let us in, begged Marie-Therese and her brother, all of them banging on the doors. They shouted and they banged as loud as they could, hammering, 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 but there was no response. Marie-Therese couldn't breathe. Panic swelled in her chest as the mob grew closer. Then, finally a miracle. The door swung open and her father and his guards stood there wild-eyed. They ushered the women and children into the room and slammed the doors, locking and barring them. Blessed silence. Marie-Therese turned to look at her mother in confusion. Where was the mob? Where was the noise? A knock at the door and a reassurance came in the form of Paris's commander-in-chief and hero of the American War of Independence, the Marquis de Lafetti. It's okay now, Majesties. The mob is back outside, came his soothing tones. They turned in hushed voices. Marie-Therese strained her ears in an attempt to hear what was being said, but it was impossible over the cries of her brother, who trembled in their nanny's arms. Then de Lafayette drew her father to the balcony. Papa, no! Marie-Therese cried. They were animals, monsters. They had weapons and would surely kill her gentle papa. I must, Marie-Therese, to protect you, your mother and your brother, and in fact the whole nation. It is my duty as king. He squared his shoulders and held his head high. But Marie-Therese could see his hands trembling. Incredibly, as King Louis and de Lafayette stepped tentatively onto the balcony, it wasn't the sound of guns that greeted them, but cheers, actual cheers, from the previously braying mob. And then, Viva le Roy! Long live the king! Over and over. From where they sat, Marie-Therese could hear her father promising that he would return to Paris. This was met with more cheers. The ice that had frozen over Marie-Therese's heart started to crack and fall. Maybe it would all be okay yet. As her father returned back to the room, a new call went out. 
The crowd were now calling for her mother. King Louis turned to smile at his beautiful Marie and then de Lafette encouraged her to go with him onto the balcony and to bring the children. Let France see their future, he encouraged. Shaking legs and feeling as if she was going to be sick, they stepped out onto the balcony. As soon as the crowd saw them, the atmosphere changed. What had been a celebratory mood suddenly reflected the sky, filled with grey-black clouds that threatened the very air around them. It seemed the crowd felt very differently about their queen than they did their king. Send the Dauphin and Princess back inside, screamed the crowd. As the guards pulled her back, Marie Therese saw multiple members of the mob raise their guns and level them at her mother's chest. Mama! Mama! screamed Marie Therese as she was pulled further away from the window and the threat of the crowd. But Marie Antoinette stood there proudly. She was every inch a queen, staring at the crowd. As it began to quieten, de Lafayette knelt before her and kissed her hand. Then it happened. First one voice, then two, then multiple, shouting a cheer they hadn't heard for a long time. Viva Lorraine! Long live the Queen! The nightmare was broken. Marie Therese buried her face into the skirts of one of her mother's ladies and sobbed, letting out all the fear and anguish that she had been carrying since this whole nightmare had begun. Several hours later, the royal carriage was ready. Marie Therese joined her parents and brother as the train set off. They were surrounded by guards, but also tens of thousands of people, all marching back to Paris. Marie Therese tried to pretend it was a royal procession. She could almost fool herself into thinking it was with the jubilant shouts and food being passed around. That was, of course, if he ignored the glares of the hatred being sent their way every time Marie Therese peeped through the carriage's curtains. That, and the heads on spikes being carried like flags, heads of the unfortunate guards who had fallen victim to the mod, was trying to protect Marie Therese and her family. Her papa sat slumped. He kept muttering to himself that things would never be the same again. After what had seemed like such a strong show of courage from him this morning, Marie Therese struggled to see him brought so low. After nine laborious hours, which felt like multiple lifetimes, they finally reached the gates of the Tuileries Palace. Marie Therese had not been there before and was shocked and horrified to see that their new accommodations looked more like a prison in ruins than a palace. As they entered the halls, a guard rushed forward. What are your orders now, sir? Let everyone put himself where he pleases, her father snarled. Bring me from the library every book we have on the deposed King Charles I of England that he turned and stormed off into the king's rooms, leaving Marie Therese to wonder at their changing fates. Chapter 11 Leone Life continued much as before. The women who took part in the march were heralded as heroes and often cheered as mothers of the nation but it didn't seem to make much difference in their daily lives that Leone could see. Uncle Jean-Luc often came to the house to moan to Mama that a satisfactory constitution still hadn't been agreed upon. Many of the king's deputies had refused to return to the city, leaving him stranded in what must seem like a sea of enemies. But any time Leone started to feel sorry for him, she thought of her lost brother Francis, and then her heart hardened again. It was said that the royal family complained of being prisoners, trapped within the Tuileries palace. Leone would grow angry on hearing this. How could they complain about living in a giant palace, with their every want met and never knowing desperate hunger or freezing cold? The seasons passed. And then the years. More and more of the king's supporters fled abroad, facing exile rather than answering for their actions against the people. 
It was said that the Queen was making more and more of the decisions, that the King refused to lead the country. It felt like the country would forever be stuck in this political limbo, where no one really had a say in what happened or made decisions. It was then that everything changed. Chapter 12 Marie Therese It had seemed so simple. Mama had promised them that everything was prepared. The royalist supporters had a plan to get them over the border, across the German kingdoms and into Austria, where her mother's family would be waiting to receive them and provide sanctuary. The family were bundled into a waiting stagecoach in the dead of night, moving swiftly and quietly under the instructions of the remaining guardsmen who were still loyal to their king. She was told that they would soon be at the royalist citadel of Montemedi, a citadel so fortified that even the hordes who attacked them at first sight would never be able to break through. They had made their break, and at first it all seemed to be going to plan. They were away, all together, and travelling without anyone stopping them. They were finally free. They'd be safe at last. And then it happened. They were drawing closer and closer to Montemedi, so close that Marie Therese felt she could finally breathe freely again. She knew there was only 30 miles left when they reached the small town of Verenez. It had been prearranged for them to stop there for food and rest. Now, instead of being greeted by a loyal royalist who would provide them with somewhere safe to stay for the night, a crowd was waiting. Her mother gave a shriek of horror on seeing the mob. There was no way for the family to escape. The family was arrested, like common criminals. Her father, the God-ordained king, treated as a monster, or even worse, a buffoon. And Marie Therese knew the real monsters were those who were dragging them back to their personal prison in Paris. You thought you were so clever, so untouchable, mocked one man, sneering at the family. But you were so narcissistic that you couldn't resist sticking your head out of the window and thumbing your nose at us. You are identified by a mere postmaster who recognised your arrogant visage. Marie Therese watched her father shudder. He'd been so sure the anti-royalist feelings had been confined to Paris and that the general public would still respect him as king. Sadly, it seemed his superior image of himself and the power he once wielded was finally shattered before his eyes. This time, it felt so much worse being locked within the Toulouse palace. This time all hope of them ever leaving, ever escaping, had evaporated. Marie Therese's mother, however, remained a force to be reckoned with, where her father had become even meeker, ready to give in to their every wish and demand. The rebel assembly put before him, Marie Antoinette, remained firm and reminded the king of who he was supposed to be. The National Assembly had evolved and they now called themselves the Legislative Assembly. It didn't matter what they called themselves, they were still traitors to their king and country. Under the influence of his wife and in a bid to show that he was still the monarch and that his will would still be obeyed, Louis rejected the advice of even the more moderate constitutionalists. He refused to implement the previously agreed constitutional reforms or accede to their increasing demands for change. As the winter of 1791 rolled in, he held firm, bolstered by the support and persuasion of his queen. The rebels may have broken her father's power, but he still blocked them from moving forward with their unnatural and irrelevant plans. Winter turned to spring and spring to summer. Marie Therese couldn't help but notice a change in her parents' mood. They seemed suddenly more hopeful. Marie Therese wondered if there was a plan to once again try and run away. But then in April the cause of their hope was revealed. He's done it! The Austrian Duke of Brunswick has done as he promised! Her mother clutched the pages as if it was the most sacred letter ever written. 
He has declared a proclamation that they will destroy Paris if we are put in danger again. Both Austria and Prussia are coming. They're coming to restore the king to his rightful powers and have declared that any man or town that defy them will be condemned to death by martial law. They will bring an army. We will all be saved. Chapter 13 Leone He's as wicked as an Austrian witch. He sent for foreign armies to defy the will of his own people, to invade and kill his subjects in pursuit of his own selfish intentions. What kind of king would rather destroy his kingdom than see his subjects happy and equal? Uncle Jean-Luc slammed his cup on the wooden table and Leone could see the rage boiling up in him. The frustration of the years since the storming of the Bastille, with little change or equality to show for it, was starting to show in his face, the flecks of grey threading through his dark hair. He can't be allowed to succeed, huffed Celeste. Mamma finished tidying the kitchen and drew up a chair opposite her brother. He won't, I can promise you. Robespierre will see to that. There is another protest plan for tomorrow. We're going to storm the Toulouse Palace. He will answer for his refusal to support the Constitution. What time do we leave? Leone excitedly ran to grab her shoes. No, not this time, Leone. It won't be safe. He gave Mama a firm look, as if passing a silent message with his eyes that only Mama could read. But Uncle, I watched the storming of the Bastille when I was much younger. I marched from Mama to Versailles. I... No! His fierce rebuke made Leone jump. No, Leone, it will not be safe. I know you're my little revolutionary, but this time you must stay home. Leone scowled and stomped off to bed. She was already planning to sneak off at first light. Mamma must have guessed. The next morning she awoke to find Mamma sat on her chair in front of the door with her pile of darning next to her. To earn extra money Mamma had taken to fixing other people's torn clothes. She had the neatest stitches, transforming rags to new looking garments once again. Fast as she was, Leone knew her pile would take her the best part of the day. Mamma would not be going anywhere. You can start the breakfast, Leone, as you're up so early, she gave Leone a stern look, telling her she knew of all her intentions. Leone spent the day feeling like a trapped animal caught in a hunter's trap. Agitation ran through her veins. She needed to know what was happening. How could Mamma not desire to know? Finally, late into the night, long after the sun had set, and most people would be asleep. There was a banging on the door. Mamma pushed her sewing onto a pile on the floor and quickly pushed her chair to the side to throw open the door. Uncle Jean-Luc stood there wild-eyed. We did it, Celeste! We took the palace! You have the king? Jean-Luc spat onto the floor. No, he and his cursed family escaped. They're hiding out of the legislative assembly but we've flushed them out like the trap rats that they are. A shiver went down Leone's spine. She couldn't help it. She knew the princess was spoilt, indulged, fattened on the profits of the labours and sorrows of the poor. But she was also the same age as Leone, just 14 years old. And Leone couldn't help but imagine being trapped and surrounded by an angry mob baying for her family's blood. It took three days before the family were finally captured. Leone couldn't imagine the terror that the princess must have felt, listening to the shouts growing closer and closer before surrounding them. She woke up in the middle of the night, her heart racing, having dreamt that it was her that was trapped and awaiting capture. The king was stripped of his powers by the legislative assembly, who claimed it was a temporary suspension. He was then officially arrested and moved to the Temple Keep to be imprisoned there whilst the Queen and the Dauphin and the Princess were kept to the palace under house arrest. But then six days later, Jean-Luc brought news that even Leone couldn't understand. 
the Queen and her children have also been arrested and moved to Temple Keep. But Uncle, they're just children. Why are they being sent to jail? Jean-Luc shrugged. He felt little empathy for a couple of spoilt brats. But Leonie was beginning to have her doubts over how they were being treated. It's for their own good, he said gruffly, and made it clear he didn't want to discuss them any further. Chapter 14 Marie-Therese Marie-Therese clutched her younger brother as they both sat and cried. Never had they known such horrors. The room they were locked in was bare and damp, and the only thing covering the cold stone walls was mould. They were hungry too. Marie-Therese thought she had known what it was like to feel hungry, but nothing in her short life had ever prepared her for this level of hunger. Gone were the roast meats and cakes. Now they had stale bread and gruel, if they were lucky. Their mother kept staring out of the small window and muttering to herself about how the Christian kings would not stand for this, how her homeland would come to save them. But Marie-Therese had little faith in the Austrians or anyone else. If her father, the king of the greatest nation on earth, could not save them, then who could? They had not seen her papa since they entered the temple. Whenever they asked to see him, the guards just laughed. Not a friendly, kind laugh, but one that made you feel even more scared. He was to be put on trial, they told her, for crimes against the constitution and the country. But that didn't make sense to Marie-Therese. How could her father commit crimes against the nation when he was the nation, the papa of the whole nation? Days flowed into nights, and nights into days, until she lost all sense of time. They were only allowed outside under the care of a few guardsmen for a turn around the grounds in the cool mornings when the mist was still in the air and, the, and it was damp and cold. Marie-Therese was forgetting what it was like to feel the sun on her skin. She'd give anything for a few unguarded minutes outside, to feel full daylight and breathe freely, and not be trapped with stale, fetid air of their cell, which was contaminated with the stench of their unemptied chamber pots. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. The final days of summer had passed quickly, as had the autumn. Soon it was winter, and with it came the cold, freezing, icy cold, from which there was no respite. No extra blankets were brought, no extra firewood. It seemed that the rebels didn't actually care if they died. They all developed coughs and would huddle together to try and stay warm. Even when they finally did manage to drift off to sleep, they'd be awoken, if not by their own coughing, then by the others. The food became even more scarce. Marie-Therese was alarmed to see that all of their ribs were beginning to show. Her younger brother's round podginess had completely disappeared. Instead of the rosy-cheeked, healthy boy he'd been, he looked pale and thin, tired and worn down from their months in captivity. There was no entertainment. There was no respite. Marie-Therese couldn't understand how anyone could treat others like this. Why were the people doing this to them? Why did they hate her family so much? Her mother reminded them that they were lucky to have each other. Her poor papa was all alone in this. At least they had each other to hug, to share stories of precious memories. He had no one with whom to break the endless monotony of each passing day. It was then that the news came. News so horrible that Marie-Therese began to shake upon hearing it and felt like she'd never be able to stop. The Legislative Assembly had found her father guilty of all the charges against him. Charges her mother had promised were made up and couldn't possibly hold. But the nightmare only spiralled. Her papa, her dear, sweet, quiet papa, had been sentenced to death begged to be allowed to see him, to say their goodbyes, but the guards refused. They didn't even know it had happened until the day the guards, drunk on beer and wine, which was flowing in celebration, shouted at them if they wished to see their majestic King Louis, his head was now displayed at the Palace de Revolution. 
her mother screamed. She screamed and screamed and rocked back and forth as if she would never stop. Marie Therese and Louis Charles cried in grief and fear. Nothing would ever be right in the world again. And the guards? They just laughed. Their evil, nasty laughs. Laughed and laughed and laughed. Chapter 15 Leone The celebrations after King Louis's execution had lasted for days. People couldn't believe that they were finally free of the corrupt monarchy which had dominated and dictated their lives. Now they would all be equal. No more serfdoms. No more starvation. No more unfair taxes. Or so they thought. Wars from neighbouring monarchs were waged against them. Other European powers were terrified that if they didn't make a stand, then their subjects too may decide they were stronger without a monarchy. More people were needed to fight. More money was needed to arm them. More food shortages spread across the country. Uncle Jean-Luc kept reminding them of the positives. Robespierre had been campaigning tirelessly for years to promote the voting rights of all men. They could now own their own land. They would be able to vote and make decisions about their own lives. They'd be able to move up the social ladder. No dream would be unattainable for them now. They just needed to get past this difficult period. And it wasn't the revolutionaries' fault. It wasn't that democracy didn't work. It was once again power-hungry monarchs inflicting pain and suffering on them. And this time foreign monarchs at that. Now Leonie was 15, it was time for her to get a job. With food more expensive than ever, she wanted to help her mamma, especially as she was the eldest. Her uncle pulled strings and found her a maid's job, working for one of his friends, a fellow vanquer of the Bastille. Pierre and his wife Josephine would require Leonie to clean for them, as well as to help look after their three children. They were considered part of the new bourgeoisie, having made their money from Pierre's shop selling exotic goods from abroad. Their brand of superior class was considered acceptable in the new regime. Her family's situation was improving. The extra money meant that Mama and the younger children had more food in their bellies and they could afford firewood even in the coldest months of the winter. Leonie was allowed to eat food made up for the Pierre's family meals she now tried delicacies she'd never even dreamed existed. At first, the rich foods upset her stomach and she wondered why anyone would eat them. But over time, she got used to them and now looked forward to each meal with eager anticipation. The children were easy, as having helped Mama with her brothers and sisters all her life, Leonie was confident in how to look after them. She often told them stories of the marches she'd been on, although she avoided some of the more gruesome details. She proudly wore her red, white and blue cockade, as did most people in the marketplace and streets. Every so often, people would fire rifles in the air, which was met with good-natured cheers. They were free and life was good. Occasionally, Leonie's mind would wander to the princess locked in the temple she found it easier and easier to dismiss the idea of her suffering. She was sure that as a princess she was probably still being kept in a custom to which she was used to, and if not, well then, maybe she could get a taste of what Leonie and her family had suffered for years. Pierre hosted many political and theological discussions with his friends in his parlour. Leonie would often hear their discussions as she brought their drinks and pastries. As the year went on, however, more and more of the debates were around the frustrations to do with the lack of apparent change in circumstances. We have removed the head of the snake, and yet the body keeps growing, one man shouted once, so loudly it made Leonie jump and spill the coffee she'd been pouring. It is because the nobles are still free, another man replied. It's the clergy's fault, with their indoctrination and guilting innocent folk into handing over their money and goods, another snarled. But what can be done, Pierre questioned, having listened quietly to the arguments. Stronger reforms, harsher punishments. 
They deserve to feel the pain that we have sustained. They deserve to feel the terror. 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 They deserve the terror. Chapter 16. Marie-Therese. Hand the boy over now! No, monsieur, no! The man, surrounded by guards, strode further into the room. The air was close and the stench from the chamber pot stronger than ever due to the hot, sticky July heat from which there was no respite. The windows did not open and no air flowed through the room except when the guards would briefly open the doors. The man gagged and pulled a handkerchief to cover his nose. You were told we would be called if you did not have him up and dressed. You have had ample time to say your farewells. It is the revolutionary's belief that the boy is not safe in your care. He... Not safe? Not safe? He is my son. Of course he is safe. Not from your indoctrination. Not from your lies and brainwashing. Not from your inappropriate amounts of affection. It has been noted that you seat him upon a pillow at the head of the table, that you are filling his head with the mistaken belief that he is the entitled king. Because you murdered his father, he is the king. We are a republic, madame, and the sooner you realise it, the better. Louis Charles with me now. No! Marie Antoinette screeched again, pulling him behind her, as if she could hide him behind her skirts. The guard strode forward and pulled the small boy away from his mother's arms. She scrabbled forward, grabbing hold of his arm, whilst he cried and thrashed to get back to her. One soldier hoisted him over his shoulder and then stormed from the room. Please, sir, no! Marie Antoinette threw herself at the man's feet, wrapping her arms around his legs and turning her tear-stained face up towards him. Please, sir, do not take my son, he belongs with me! No, madame, he does not. He bent forwards, pulling her from his legs and crouching down. He brought his face close to hers. Mark my words. You will never speak to your Dauphin again. He threw her roughly to the ground and spun on his heels. Marie-Therese could take no more. Seeing her brother ripped from her mother's arms, seeing her mother so badly treated, hearing the cruel words that he said to her, something inside her broke. She ran towards him, screaming, Monster! Monster! and went to bang her fists against his chest. Two more guards stepped forward, each catching an arm. They held her back as the man exited the room and then pushed her roughly towards her mother, as they too left, slamming the door behind them. They could hear poor Louis Charles's cries echoing down the corridor as he was carried further and further away from them. It can be true. He was just nine years old. How could they keep him apart and isolated? Her aunt, the Princess Elizabeth of France, who was also in prison with them in their cold, barren room, gathered both Marie Antoinette and Marie Therese to her. Together they cried for the loss of Louis Charles, for the loss of Louis the Sixteenth, and for the loss of their freedom, their hopes and dreams. They wept through the night. Each day brought new sorrows and worsening treatment. There was no respect, no decency, and no respite. Each day they went up the narrow winding stairs to the top of their tower room, where there was a small window from which they could sometimes catch a glimpse of Louis Charles. Marie Antoinette would stand sometimes for hours just to see him pass by for a few seconds. She begged daily to at least speak with Louis Charles again, but they were told he was being re-educated and no longer wished to see them. She stopped asking when they began to bring him past the window dressed in red bonnets and singing anti-monarchy, pro-revolutionary songs for the ultimate humiliation. The summer passed and September arrived. The noise within the jail intensified. More and more people were filling the rooms. When they asked what was happening, they were told it was time for their lot to feel the terror. Marie-Therese had felt nothing but terror for years. 
Wails and screams filled their days and nights. At times, Marie-Therese wondered if the whole of France was locked up in the temple with them. Then, in October, Marie-Therese's world fell apart. Her mother, her remaining rock and family, was taken away. She was to stand trial, and Marie-Therese no longer believed it would be fair. After the murder of her papa, how could she hope that her mamma would be freed? She scratched a desperate message into the stone of the walls of the temple room so that the generations who came after would know her pain. Marie-Therese Charlotte is the most unhappy person in the world. She can obtain no news of her mother, nor be reunited to her, although she has asked a thousand times. Live, my good mother, whom I love well, but of whom I can hear no tidings. Oh, my father, watch over me from heaven above. Oh, my God, forgive those who have made my parents suffer. Chapter 17, Leone Guilty! Guilty! They found her guilty! Pierre rushed into the room and shouted the news to Josephine. Leone had been polishing the silver and turned as he spoke. Josephine gasped and clutched her hands to her mouth. Come, come, they're going to execute her today. We should go now if we want to watch. Sir, may I come too? Leone remembered the glimpse of the haughty face she saw staring from the royal carriage window all those years ago on the march back to Paris. She couldn't imagine how anyone could dare to execute such a woman. She was so regal, so sure of herself. Of course, but we must leave now. They joined the crowds, who were swarming towards the Palace de Revolution, where the large guillotine now stood. As they reached the edges of the crowd, a cheer went up. A cart rumbled down the streets, with the woman, who had once been their queen, contained inside. Once the cart stopped, she quietly stood, her head held high. She left the cart and moved towards the stage where the guillotine stood. They tried to bind her hands, but she refused, insisting instead on holding on to a crucifix, her lips moving silently in prayer. When the end came, it was quick. The executioner lifted her head into the air and a cheer rose from the crowd. They only wanted to block out the horror and see the gruesome and terrible sight, but she couldn't tear her eyes away. She was shocked as people began surging forward, dipping their handkerchiefs into the blood spilling onto the floor. She turned to look at Josephine and Pierre and found Josephine with her head buried in her husband's chest, tears rolling down her cheeks as he tried to both soothe her and gently remind her that it was best not to be seen so upset at the Queen's death. Leonie felt confused. So many seemed to be rejoicing at the Queen's death, but Josephine seemed shocked and scared. As they returned to Pierre's house, he turned to dismiss her for the day. She returned to Mamma's house and told all that she had seen. The next day, Pierre called Leone into his office. You must excuse Josephine yesterday. She was just overwhelmed with happiness at the end of the monarchy, he informed Leone. Leone was silent. It had been clear that Josephine had been scared and sad, not happy in the slightest, the day before. She didn't understand why Pierre was saying this now. Please. I must ask you not to speak of Josephine's behaviour to anyone. Of course, sir. She bobbed a curtsy and then left the room. She was confused at first and didn't understand Josephine's reaction or the lies. Pierre was telling her about it, but soon things became clearer for Leone. Rumours started spreading of arrests and mass imprisonments. First from the nobles and clergy. But quickly, more and more ordinary people were being arrested. Anyone believed to be enemies of the revolution were being rounded up and locked away. Anyone who spoke up against this insane practice were themselves imprisoned. Even members of the assembly who had worked so hard for the freedom of all were not safe. On Christmas Eve, the journalist and politician Camille Desmoulins tried to distance himself from the extreme and radical events standing up to Robespierre and telling him, 
You want to remove all your enemies by means of the guillotine. Has there ever been such fully? Could you make a single man perish on the scaffold without making ten enemies of for yourself from his friends and family? I think quite differently from those who tell you that the terror must remain the order of the day. Of course, he was imprisoned and sentenced for execution soon after that. Then the mass executions began. Each day the bells tolled, announcing more and more deaths. Jean-Luc had been admiring at first, declaring that France was cleansing itself so that they could finally move forward with the revolutionary changes. But over time, even Jean-Luc's faith became shaky. More and more arrests. More and more executions. Everyone began to second-guess their every word and action. Could anything they say be mistaken for anti-revolutionary sentiment? Could a joke they made years ago now be taken as evidence that they were enemies of the state? Leone now understood Pierre's fear that people who witnessed Josephine's reaction to Marie Antoinette's death may believe that she held sympathy for the Queen, that she disapproved of her execution, that she too was an enemy of the state. Leone was concerned too, not just because she would lose her position and fancy food and extra money if Josephine was arrested, but for the safety of Josephine herself. Pierre seemed quieter and quieter in the political debates held in the house. People were no longer sure what they should or shouldn't support or believe. The wrong line of thinking could lead to you losing your head. Chapter 18. Marie-Therese More and more people filled the cells. Conditions grew worse. They went longer and longer between eating. Some people grew so desperate, they even captured the rats and mice who ran through the cells and ate them raw. Marie-Therese felt no sympathy for the rodents. Everyone was covered in bites and scars from where the vermin attacked them at night. Everyone itched and scratched, and then lice spread around the cells too. Diseases spread quickly, and each day bodies stiff and cold were carried from the cells as yet another person succumbed to the poor conditions. After the wrenching away of her mamma, Marie-Therese had given up any hope of ever escaping these walls and being reunited with her family. This was made worse when her beloved aunt was taken away too, Another brick added to her war of loneliness, another enemy of the nation to be tried for invented crimes simply due to the circumstances of her birth. If God-appointed kings could be killed, what hope did princes and princesses have? Chapter 19 Leone The worst had happened. Uncle Jean-Luc had been arrested. He was a proud revolutionary, but according to Robespierre, he was the wrong kind, his beliefs dangerous and ultimately anti-revolutionary. Leone couldn't understand. How could her uncle, who'd been given everything, risked everything for the revolution, be anti-revolutionary? He wasn't the only one. Neighbours seemed to turn against neighbour, friend into foe. No one could be trusted. Even the slightest suggestion of disagreement seemed to lead to accusations of traitors against freedom. Mama and Leone tried to find out where Jean-Luc had been sent and how they could get him food if he was still alive. But when they approached the jail, they themselves were threatened with arrest as collaborators. The numbers of execution meant it was impossible to keep track of who had died and who was still alive. The bodies were all discarded in mass graves, as if the very streets of Paris run with blood, the smell of death permeating the air everywhere you went. Mama was terrified that at any moment there would be a knock at the door and they too would be led away. Their priest, Father Claude, was one of the first to be taken and it seemed that even practising Christianity was now a crime. More and more people, day after day. Everyone was struck by the terror. No one was safe. The terror filled every citizen's waking moment and haunted everyone's dreams. 
This came as no surprise when Leone arrived at Pierre's home to find it empty. They'd been taken in the night, the children with them. Leone didn't know she'd ever see them again, and afraid that if she did, it meant she too had been arrested. And then, when it seemed as though Robesphere would not stop until every single Parisian's head was on a spike, he himself was arrested. The very next day, the orchestra of the terror, the cause of so many deaths, was himself killed by guillotine, suffering the same fate to which he had condemned so many. The newspapers reported that people were throwing themselves into each other's arms and crying, The tyrant is no more! Now, with his demise, there came an end to the terror. People were pardoned and released from prison. Family members were finally returning home, scarred and traumatised from their surgeon into hell, but alive. One evening, there was a quiet knock at the door. Mama rushed to see who it was, crying with delight as Jean-Luc staggered into the room. He was covered in dirt, his hair and beard matted with months of grime. He was almost skeletal, as grey as a corpse, only his ragged breathing giving away the fact that he was still alive. Hunched over, he looked twenty years older than when they last saw him, what seemed like a lifetime before. It's a week before he said a word, communicating only with shakes and nods of his head. But once he started talking, it was like a dam had broken. He couldn't stop unburdening himself of all the horrors he'd lived through in the prisons. Mama said that he'd need a lot of love and care, but that the old Jean-Luc was still in there. Leone was unsure. He seemed so changed, so haunted. She couldn't quite believe that this shadow of an uncle would ever be replaced with the solid and dynamic man he once was. Pierre and Josephine never did return. Josephine and the children had fallen ill in prison. First the youngest had died, and then one by one the rest had succumbed. Pierre had survived sickness and disease, only to be dragged to the guillotine, one of the last victims of the terror. Mama said that they would all need time, rest and care to heal, Leone was unsure. How could a nation heal from such an event? Learn to trust one another or ever feel normal again? Chapter 20 Marie Therese The prisons had emptied. Slowly, slowly, the noises quietened. Those who had been crammed into the room alongside Marie Therese were pardoned and released. This was not to be the fate for Marie Therese. Still, she remained locked within these cold stone walls. Then, one summer's day, an unnatural quiet fell around the prison. Marie Therese knew something was badly wrong. She knew at any moment the guards would come and gleefully pass her another message that would further shatter her heart. Now here they were, and here it was. Marie Therese sat numbly. She no longer had any more tears to cry. All her tears had been spent. She was sure she was already a ghost herself, just a shell of a body with no more emotions, no more hopes or dreams. After the guards left, she silently lay on her side and faced the wall. Surely soon her time would come, and when it did, she would gladly welcome it. What was left for her here, except slowly starving, until she simply faded into nothing? She carried for all this time the secret hope, deep, deep down inside of her, that her mamma was all right. That the Austrians would pull strings to get them and Louis Charles released into their care. But now that belief too was gone. What would they do? Why would they go to the trouble for just her, a mere girl, now that Louise Charles was dead? Yet, it was when all hope was lost, when winter had come round again, a cold winter Marie Therese was sure would be the end of her, and that she would succumb to the tuberculosis that had robbed her of both her brothers. That's when it happened. The guards arrived on the eve of her 16th birthday. 
This was the moment she thought she was preparing for, when they'd drag her before a court for her own trial. But instead she was informed she was being released. Their parting gift was to inform her that, of all her family, she alone had survived. So after three years held in the depths of hell, after losing her mother, her father, her aunt and her brother, she was finally free. Things moved quickly from there. Within a month she was saying goodbye to France. After everything that had happened and all that it had taken from her, Marie-Therese was certain she would never want to return. At any moment she was sure a crowd would surge forward, declaring there had been a mistake and drag her back to her permanent incarceration. Even when she reached Austria, even after she was reassured by family members, none of whom she had never met, that she was safe, even after she was cleaned and dressed once again in the finest dresses, she didn't feel safe. Every night she expected to hear the screams of a mob coming to get her, and would wake trembling and heart racing in the dark room. Candlelight on the palace walls terrified her, as she imagined it was the flickering flames of the torches carried by the horde. She dreamt frequently of her mamma, her papa, her brother, that they were back at the palace of Versailles, boating on the lake, riding on her father's horses, watching fireworks at the end of one of her mother's parties. Each morning she woke with fresh tears on her face, and wished that she would once more hold each one of them close. If only she could, she would never ever let them go. But slowly, slowly, she found her smile again. One day she even startled herself when she laughed out loud, a sound she thought her body had forgotten to make. She began to find joy in the small things again, the feel of the sun on her upturned face, especially would never grow old. She made sure she walked outside every single day, regardless of the weather. The feeling of being trapped inside was unbearable. Then one day, three years after her arrival in Austria, she was informed that she was to be married. Her husband-to-be was her cousin, Duke Louis Anton. He had been declared the last Dauphin of France, and their marriage was to strengthen his claim to the Bourbon dynasty and its throne. She was once again thrown into the forefront of the French people's minds. She knew it was her responsibility to marry Louis and to continue the family line. She owed it to her parents. She'd do her duty, like the good princess of France that she was, even if she felt that if she never heard the word France again, she'd be happier than any man could ever make her. She'd think of her dear mamma, a stranger in a strange land, who wore her dignity like one of her beautiful dresses, and she would survive. Chapter 21 Leone He's done it! He's done it! Uncle John Luke limped through the front door. It had been four years since the end of the terror, and he had been left with permanent physical reminders of his time in the depths of hell. The only paused to stand fully and straighten her back. Her rounded belly rippled at the sound of her uncle's voice, the baby responding to him in, as if in celebration. It had been a year since Leonie had married Olivia, and Jean-Luc had come to live with them, being too frail to work any more. Who's done what, uncle? She hadn't seen him this jubilee in years. It reminded her of his excitement all those years ago, when the first wisps of the revolution had caught a light. Napoleon! He's taken charge! This is the end of the directory! Finally, we might get some proper governance! Finally, the glory of the revolution may be realised! Leonie smiled indulgently at her uncle's childlike excitement. The directory, a five-member committee, had been established in the aftermath of the terror to govern the country and bring a sense of order to the ensuring chaos. As with all the other aspects of the revolution, it failed miserably and life was little better for the masses. Leonie was hopeful now, even though she had heard her uncle's declarations before. Many things had happened over the years and Leonie wasn't sure whether the revolution had been for the better or not. Food was still scarce, taxes were still high. 
wars were being fought and people were recovering from the trauma of the terror. Some things had changed, however. They did now have a little more equality and more rights to a better life. Surely that was something. Rubbing her expanding belly and wondering what future her child may face, she had to hope that Napoleon would be the answer to the problems France faced. Maybe he would be the one to lead them to a golden age, an age of freedom and plenty, where no one went hungry or had their voice silenced. Maybe this, finally, would be the true age of enlightenment, the beginning. (laughs) 